actually go build some of them and to begin with what we are going to do is we are touching the devops pillar of aws principle so devops in general yes uh, it's been a while but before devops actually there was really rough world where the developers and operations are totally different and to communicate with each other to make sure that the environment is ready to make sure that the deployment the business continuity it's a lot of a manual work involved and that's where most of the system get a long go to market time you know go to market strategies are actually get delayed and to help that solve a basic problem of uh, you know getting this continuous deployment continuous integration so you will see a lot of time the continuous world is actually overloaded but that's how it allows us to do all things continuously and make sure we get uh, the value from what are the proposition we have in terms of a data in terms of application in terms of infrastructure in very short amount of time so devops yes it began with you know a small you know puppet shift that kind of thing on on premise system as part of a aws ecosystem it's been a while like they have sdks uh, the cloud formation and cdks nowadays what they called as and how they are evolved what are the actually need how we can define devops what are the important things that devops actually takes care in today's world right so it's a it's a change in terms of how we implement them but the basic strategy the basic a uh, reason behind the basic backbone of devops it still exists and in fact it's get evolved over part of a time that's going to that's what we are going to discuss in a short while and uh, help help me my uh, colleague ajit who will be you know beginning this station begin this session and then we can uh, move along so let, let me summarize what's going to come so make, just to make sure that you are able to make most of your time so we are going to dwell down into the devops principles devops as a culture what are things we really need then what kind of you know deployment strategies and basically two things two key things will be uh, covering in this session is about how the ci cd actually works on aws and we'll do a demo of deploying actual data lake like previously we saw in a number previous sessions and to make it work uh, using the cdk so that's the highlights for today and uh, for without a further ado i'll uh, allow ajit to uh, go ahead and uh, take it forward ajit i'll as thank you nishikant okay. let me share my screen everyone able to see my screen oh, yes ajit thank you So thank you, Nishikant. Uh, so I will, uh, myself, Ajit. Uh, so I will be like uh, uh, taking you through and DevOps journey for the next forty forty five minutes, and I hope that uh, so I will add uh, some value. You will get some family with the new concept uh, with respect to the DevOps uh, there. So I uh, hope all of you are doing well and and staying safe uh, in this difficult pandemic time period there. Uh, and and uh, in this difficult time you all took some time to uh, join us uh, in this devops journey so really thank you on that part again so uh, as i said uh, so what i will be doing for the next 45 uh, 40 to 45 minutes i will walk you through the devops life cycle uh, devops some of the practices which are well known and most of us knowingly unknowingly uh, using them in our day to day activities and uh, at the end of journey i hope that i will leave you uh, with an impression and feeling that you are uh, you got uh, familiar with few of the concept which we are not uh, earlier aware of if you are earlier aware of all those concept you learn or uh, you learn certain things in addition to what you are already aware of on the particular part there so saying that uh, so as nishikant briefly touched on that point so the focus of today's session or the next 40 45 minutes period is that uh, get you familiar uh, with the devops and devops practices uh, introduce you to some of these practices up to a level so that you can understand them you can uh, talk about them as well there 
and, and at the same time, it should excite you to dig more about most of these concepts and practices as well. So that is very, very uh, critical and the important piece of this particular session. Uh, it's just not like a theoretical aspect, but it is more about curiosity and exciting you as an audience. And we also, uh, as a part of this entire learning session there, so we should get excited. We should uh, spend some more additional time to dig all of these practices. And, and burn our hand uh, with respect to the DevOps practices on that side there as well. Good. So uh, as a part of the next uh, uh, time, uh, next 40, 45 minute time period there, so what we will be covering is that initially we will start with the DevOps life cycle. It talks about uh, the typical software development life cycle, but how the DevOps is uh, a bit different, uh, more productive and efficient as compared to some of the other uh, SDLC practices there. So we'll quickly go through on that life cycle period. And then, uh, so we will be focusing uh, more on four very critical, important practices, uh, which as I said, some of us are already following, some of us are just knowing about it, uh, is that continuous integration and continuous deployment or uh, delivery there. So everybody who just started their DevOps journey, they always uh, synonym the DevOps with CI/CD there. The CI/CD is definitely one of the very important and critical part of this DevOps life cycle, but there are other aspect of this entire uh, life cycle, uh, which helps you to achieve uh, that development in, in much better and faster way there. And the next, uh, as a part of this DevOps practices, we will be uh, covering or get you introduced to the microservices concept. Uh, then after that, we will cover the infrastructure as a core. Uh, after that, once considering everything is deployed into the cluster, the next very critical important piece for and, and the operations engineer is how do we monitor this entire infrastructure? How do we make sure that the application logs are available, infrastructure logs are available, so that we understand how things are working in the live environment there. So that, that is where the, the last and important piece we will be covering at least in the today's session. There are a few other things as well there, uh, but as a part of today's session, we will be covering these four parts, that is CI/CD, microservices, infrastructure as a code, then monitoring and logging there. And then we will be going through and short a very quick demo, which will uh, give you an idea about how some of these practices works in the lifetime. We will be going through and we have one simple uh, application uh, and through that deployment of that application, development of that application, I will try to uh, give you an overview about how exactly this works there and how does it will help you in your day-to-day -day activities on that line. And when that part is done, uh, so we will be specifically focusing on deployment strategies as well. So there are different ways uh, in which the applications processes can be deployed into the production or even the different environment. So what are those and then in what situation, what are specific use cases where we should be using what kind of uh, deployment strategy that part will follow. And after that, uh, Nishikant will take you through a journey about uh, in, in, in depth of uh, infrastructure as a code there. He will be focusing more on the cloud formation CDK and he will uh, walk you through or uh, demonstrate you uh, about the data lake as a code uh, through this entire exercise there. So let's move. Uh, so as Nishikan uh, mentioned that you will hear this continuous word uh, very frequently in this particular session there, because that is very, very critical and the central piece of this entire DevOps life cycle there. So, so, so when we say DevOps, it, it's just not a, like a single technology or a single practice. It is more of a set of practices that allows a single thing. So I'm focusing or emphasizing more on this single thing, because that is very, very critical piece when it comes to an implementation part there. So it is a set of practices that allows a single team to manage the entire application development life cycle, right from development, testing, deployment, and then monitoring as well. There. So uh, as I mentioned, like, uh, it's a single team. So earlier, if you see, we are generally working in the silos. We have a development team. We have operations team. We have quality engineering or the testing team there, and, and uh, really cycle teams there. But as a part of this DevOps life cycle, there are certain cultural changes which are needs to be happened there. And what are those cultural changes? The one important and, and very, very critical piece of this cycle is that 
all the teams should not work in silos there everybody should work as an, a single unit or a single team and they should very actively closely collaborate with each other there and and how does that help we, we will uh, see it in the uh, in some time there so basically devops is just an another uh, software development life cycle which describes the journey of product development or any application development right from the start which is like uh, capturing the customer uh, actual requirement then starting the development till getting it deployed to the production there so we know that uh, devops is not uh, the first life cycle uh, or it's not a very new concept there and there were earlier so sdlc life cycles were available there like we are having uh, iterative or spiral models also into the picture there but then what is so different in uh, in the devops there so if you just try to see a spiral model or even the agile development model earlier there are sort of similar kind of structures or similar kind of uh, philosophies where there are but then uh, in that spiral or the iterative model or even in the agile model so what was happening so there are some set of goal or some set of feature which we were expected to deliver at the end of first release there so we start with that concept and and keep reiterating that particular set of feature which needs to be delivered to the client here we are not entirely focusing always on releasing some set of features or a very important milestone of that particular uh, software journey there what we will be what we generally do or like general philosophical uh, devops life cycle is that we should continuously keep releasing those particular software as soon as possible there so so the main objective of the devops philosophy or the devops uh, life cycle is that it gets rid of the shortcoming which were present in the earlier models so what so getting rid of the shortcoming what happens we achieve the delivery in much faster and the predictable manner there so uh, the next point in this life cycle which is very important is that it, it combines the important function of the development team and the operations team as well there in in, in the earlier uh, different uh, models and different philosophies we were working in silos there so in this particular devops life cycle of the model we are making sure or we should generally make sure that the development team and the operation teams work together as a team on that particular side and what how does it helps them it helps you to understand the customer needs in a much better fashion because when we do a development it just not about writing and code which solves some problem it does involve the underlying infrastructure underlying system which will help you to get an better understanding about the entire ecosystem of the particular application or the product and then deliver that to the client end and that is where when the operations teams and the development teams work very closely it helps you to understand the customer needs in a much better fashion on that particular level. so uh, so in the life cycle there are like typically six uh, major components uh, it starts with the development uh, and then once the development started we continuously integrate them then at the same time we keep testing all the individual components com commits feature and everything there once some of those things are ready we will start uh, continuously deploying uh, the, those early releases once it is deployed it could be in the development environment it could be in the production environment so we need to monitor that environment that is where the next part of this particular life cycle comes into the picture and once that particular software is deployed into the production there or in the environment there we need to continuously observe we need to continuously uh, monitor that environment try to understand how it behaves not just from an application point of view but from an infrastructure point of view as well there and whatever is the the matrices we collect from there whatever the logs we collect from there so using that matrices we understand how it is behaving and that feedback is again passed to the development team and that particular iteration keeps continuously happening there so i will just take a quick pause here uh, uh, like if someone has any questions or anything so that we can start from there okay i will consider uh, no question there and i will move forward yeah so before uh, going into the details of the ci cd and few of these practices what i will be doing i will give a very quick uh, uh, demo about uh, what we generally do in the development cycle and how does it will uh, i will try to correlate some of this concept with uh, the ci cd practices there 
So what I did, I have already deployed in one uh, web application, which is a very simple, just a uh, page there, which displays this particular message. So if you see, it is refreshing. So this is what the simple HTTP application, which I have deployed. So some of the components I have already taken care of it. And, and in the later parts, once I cover some of this uh, DevOps practices, I will go in with details about what exactly is happening here. So what I will be doing here is that, so as I said, I have already deployed that application. It is running on one of the hosts there. And, and this is my, uh, the source code repository. In typical environment, like we have a development team which uh, make the changes. And what we expect that, that changes should automatically gets tested, gets debugged, and gets even deployed into, in the initial stage of that development uh, uh, infrastructure side there. What I will do here, so if you see, we are only seeing congratulations here. This is uh, the current page there. Consider an, uh, uh, any different examples. So what we will do, we will be adding some features there. So as a part of this particular demo, what I will do, I will just change that particular message from congratulation to just mark that as an V1, meet of V1 there and just save it there. So just give us a minute and then you will see that okay, there is an already a pipeline which I have already defined uh, so that whenever we make any changes, that changes should automatically get reflected into uh, the development of the production or whatever the environment is here. Okay, so we have made the changes. What we will do is that we will put it into staging then pushing the changes, right? So what the development team or like anybody who is into the software engineering, what they expect, whatever changes they made, how, how does it looks into an uh, sort of live environment there? So when I say live environment, uh, so the underlying infrastructure, they expect it to be as similar to the production one, and they wanted to test or they wanted to see how their changes are getting reflected into the live environment. There. So they don't want it to bother who is creating that infrastructure, who, who will be maintaining how to and the rest of the things with respect to infrastructure. The moment they save the code, they wanted to see how that code is behaving into the live environment. So what I did, I just pushed those changes and we have a pipeline already created. So we, I will go in details about that. If you see, it already sends, okay, there is some commit has been happened into our Git repository, which is our uh, project product or application, whatever it is. It starts committing or it start building, it start uh, making those changes and start deploying at the same time to an live environment. If you see here, it just, whatever the changes has been committed into a Git repo, a like repository. Here we are using AWS code repository there, code commit service there. It sensed, it applied all the changes into a live environment. If you see, it has already deployed it into production or like the live environment. Yeah, right? Isn't it all of us expect that like the similar kind of environment so that we can quickly test what those changes we are making and then how does those changes actually gets reflected. So if you see here, the development team is not at all getting involved how that infrastructure is managed. They are not even talking to the infrastructure team to set up and then make that environment available so that they start testing some of their uh, commits as badly as possible before delivering it to the clients there. So how does that can be done in a faster manner, efficient manner, so that they can see all of these changes pretty quickly there. So we have, so that is where uh, some of the DevOps practices which we'll be covering will uh, play a role here. So let's just keep your thought. Uh, let's, let's keep your question for some time hold and we'll get back to some of those questions in case you have it, how does exactly it works and how does the DevOps help in that entire uh, journey there? So as we covered uh, as a part of the DevOps lifecycle, we have a different stages there and different uh, practices there. So we will start with the continuous integration. 
So what is continuous integration? So it is basically a process which automates the build and the testing of code every time the team member commits here. So if you see uh, the quick demo, which I have given you there, the moment I updated that uh, index.html that gets committed to repository and once it is committed, it, on the back end there are certain pieces which takes care of building it, making sure everything is good. It does the testing and it gets deployed into the actual uh, infrastructure as well there. So that is where the continuous integration plays an important role. So, so continuous integration is more about automating the build and the test part of uh, this entire software lifecycle there. So we know that developers regularly merge their code changes into the central repository. Uh, and once they merge all of this code, automatically on the back end, this build and the testing phase gets run there. And earlier, what used to happen is that, uh, so the development team generally used to restrict the number of commits they do it per day, or like they haven't set up frequency, uh, frequency, like in a week, we will make sure whatever the patches have been built, they are getting committed there. But with this continuous integration, we are not restricting the development team when they should be committing it there. The moment they commit it, and that commit gets to a proper branch, here for a demo purpose, I'm putting it directly into the master branch. In the real life, that will not happen there. But uh, uh, so what we expect development team to not bother about when to commit those changes. They can just commit the changes and it gets committed to an appropriate branch. It could be a, a feature branch, a branch which is a lower than the actual master branch, which will get deployed into production there. So once those changes are getting committed, so as I said, on the back end, so this continuous integration will make sure that it, it does a different test. And after the testing is done, it does a quick build there. So it helps you to understand. So whatever the commits are done, are those uh, changes or the commits are causing any problem? Does it uh, cause an code conflict? Is it uh, building properly or not? So all those things happen automatically and, and who does that on the back end, it is one of the DevOps practice, which we call it as a continuous integration there. So how does this CI uh, continuous integration helps? It, it, what it does, it helps you to improve the software quality. It helps you to reduce the time to release that software to and testing the, like the next thing, or maybe uh, considering everything is very smooth, even to deploy it into the production as well there. And once, uh, uh, the build and the testing part is done. The next part is more about how do we either deliver or deploy that particular artifacts which are generated from the continuous integration stage to a next environment. So that next environment could be, uh, uh, initially it will be generally a development environment. Once uh, the development environment says that, okay, all is good, then it will be pushed to a next like staging, the staging environment, then uh, pre-prod and the prod as well there. So this is again a very important practice of delivering that software or uh, updates to production. Here uh, I have mentioned it production, but production, but in the uh, the real life it may not be a production. It generally goes to an the development environment. Uh, so it delivers that particular software to an next stage in a smaller increment. So what that smaller increment? It's more of uh, some of the recent commits which the development team has done there. And it happens continuously. So no one at the back end is tracking okay, who has committed the changes. The moment the changes are committed, there are certain tools, certain practices uh, which are already deployed or which are already followed so that that gets, whatever the commits get changed, it gets built, tested and pushed to a next, uh, next stage of that particular uh, software development cycle there. So how does it help us? So what it helps is that the team is always ready to deliver that particular artifact or that particular uh, uh, point in time release of the software to the production or the next level there. So it gives you that agility to the team so that uh, uh, the business teams are looking to test or looking to see what is the current uh, stage of the development. They can see it at the same time. And the development team or the operation team doesn't have to be interacting very actively or like in a transactional model to the business teams also there. And that happens or that gets achieved through, through this CI and CD concepts there. So how does it help there? So in a longer run, what it does, it minimizes the risk of failure in the production. Because as I said, 
we are continuously doing this testing we are continuously building that software we are continuously delivering or even deploying it to an development uh, environment there and people are doing that continuously there or the engineering team or like the respective teams are doing that very continuously there so what it helps so it helps to minimize the risk of failure if there are any bugs if there are any issues they get caught much earlier than in that entire life cycle there before even putting in the production there okay so so we have two parts here so here if you see we are calling it as a continuous delivery or the continuous deployment on that side so when we say delivery what it does uh, so it, it, it waits for a manual intervention before putting it into a, a pre prod or even into the prod environment there so that the business team or the respective teams take uh, make sure that the release or the artifact which needs to be deployed it is the right at artifact and it is has all the required necessary checks and balances done before putting into the production there so that is a bit different between continuous delivery and continuous deployment in delivery that artifact is ready we just waiting for someone to give an acknowledgement saying that okay this is good to go into the production there and, and in certain cases once that day was practices are matured the teams are very well versed with this entire cicd concept and they are following this devops pretty uh, diligently then in, in some of the projects what they do they are not even waiting for that manual intervention what they do they just design their life cycle in such a way that some the moment this changes are getting deployed committed so the artifacts which are getting generated they gets directly deployed into the right kind of environments there yeah. so so whatever we just discussed right now more uh, from an uh, theoretical perspective so if you see this particular diagram uh, it gives you that entire picture to you there so if you see here the mouse where my mouse is right now if you can see so the development team uh, which does the development they commits their changes that commits uh, or the latest patches gets automatically pushed to code repository so on code repository there could be like different services which are available there and the moment so the continuous word uh, which you have observed in the, the day of life cycle if you see it it happens continuously the development team commits the changes the changes gets triggered the moment the changes are saved so there are triggers with respect to uh, what are the different events that repository uh, helps you to configure so the moment code is committed that event is getting triggered uh, so there are like on the back end we have the ci city concept which we just discussed or the practices so what it does uh, it builds uh, uh, those latest uh, patches which are included there it it test it does the unit test and few other test as well there and it creates a deployable package there and when that deployable package of the artifacts or the release of the software is ready it is given it to the next stage and that next stage is more of our uh, continuous deployment or delivery uh, stage there so in in that particular stage what we do uh, we do a much more a thorough testing uh, from a performance point of view how it will actually behave in the live environment so there will be like some additional tests which will be done at this particular stage uh and and this stage is nothing but a pre stage to an our actual production live environment there and this is where if you see we have a, a continuous either continuous delivery or continuous delivery continuous deployment mechanism there so in in continuous delivery mechanism if you see we have i have put two arrows there so you, we have one manual step or sometimes it even an automated steps there so when we see it is a manual step so what is happening as a part of the ci cd the release artifact or the uh, final product is ready to be deployed there but it is not deployed there so that is what we call it as a continuous delivery and some someone who uh, like maybe a product lead or product owner or uh, the respective engineer who is authorized to put into the production he will review all those things he will give an acknowledgement and once that acknowledgement is done that release will be pushed to a live environment and in the other way is that there is no manual intervention required so that generally happens to a team or the companies who are using this day of practices for so long they have this matured uh, their team is matured uh, enough to understand how it works on and some of the testing utilities some of the uh, underlying tools which they have developed they are so matured so concrete so that they know there is no manual intervention required so in that cases so whatever is the artifacts which is created from uh, the 
CI a continuous deployment or continuous delivery stage there, it's automatically get pushed into a production environment. There. So this is an, uh, a pictorial view or diagrammatic representation of the CI CD, which is one of the important concept or I, I generally call it is the heart of this DevOps practices there. And even most of the uh, engineers who are recently start getting familiar with the DevOps practices, they somehow get into and feeling that okay, CI CD is nothing but the DevOps. But CI CD is only one of the important piece, a very larger portion of the DevOps practices. And, and at the same time, it's not only part of that entire DevOps practices there. Right? So I will move from here. Uh, so as Nishikant uh, mentioned uh, here that, so today we will be focusing more uh, with respect to these DevOps practices and the DevOps tool from an AWS side of uh, AWS point of view there. So when I say AWS point of view, so just for a discussion purpose, I'm just making sure we are not uh, diverting our discussion to a larger tools because there are so many tools into the market, which helps you to uh, achieve some of these practices there. So for today's discussion, we are just narrowing down, narrow down that focus uh, to and tools or services which are provided by AWS here. So from an continuous integration and continuous delivery perspective, so AWS provides and different services. So code commit, code build, code deploy, code pipeline, code artifact, code star, these are like some of the services which are available there, uh, uh, which are available and provided by AWS and, and they, all of these services comes under develop, uh, developer toolkits there. Anybody who is familiar with uh, AWS who are actively working on it, uh, they might be familiar with some of these uh, services there. And what these services do is that they help you to achieve the CICD parts there. There are some other services as well, but these are uh, some of the important and uh, very key services from an AWS point of view, which anybody or anybody who is eager to get into the DevOps role should get familiar and, and should start uh, experimenting with all of these services as well. So code commit is nothing but an uh, source control uh, service, a managed source control service. Uh, it's like more of an, uh, the Git repository or GitLab or some other services as well there. Code build, it's more of uh, a build service which is provided by AWS there. For a discussion purpose, I'm not going into in details of all of these services. The intent for today or like focus, as I said, is just to make sure that I introduce, I get you familiar with uh, these services so that you get a fair idea what all services you should get, uh, you should start focusing on in the initial journey there. And the next is uh, the code deploy service, what it does. So whatever the artifacts which are created from a real stage, they get needs to be deployed. So, uh, so AWS provides code deploy service and, and it deploys that artifacts either into EC2 system instances, it can deploy into an on-premises instances as well there. There is a different requirement how uh, we deploy that artifacts onto on-premises instances. So we will not go in details about how the code deploy works on that particular fashion, uh, but just like for information purpose, I am uh, highlighting here. So the artifacts which are created, it can get deployed to EC2 instances, on-premises instances. We can deploy it into ECS, which is uh, Elastic Container Service provided by AWS. Then a serverless computing infrastructure, which is nothing but Lambda as well there. So these are individual services there. So the code pipeline is basically an, an, an abstract layer which sits on top of all of these services and you don't have to go to each services individually. So what it does, it helps you to create that pipeline right from source repository to a build stage, then to a deployment stage as well there. And it gives you an, uh, a nice view of that entire uh, pipeline. So they can go there, uh, even someone who is not a part of the development team, he can just go there and see how that is happening right now and what stage of that entire pipeline they build, uh, uh, that processes right now there. And then the code artifacts, it is an uh, managed artifact service provided by AWS. And then the last one is code star. So depending on uh, the development team's preference or like uh, what is their specific requirement, uh, some of the teams can either use a code star, which is more of an, a project planning tool, or like uh, in some cases, people, uh, the teams can go their own in-house or some other third-party vendor uh, tools as well. 
But the advantage if you go with the code star is that it is very tightly integrated with the rest of the services like even pipeline, artifacts and few other as well there. So you don't have to go manually to any other nodes. What you can do, you just go there and and then configure those services using the GUI uh, interface which is provided there. So that is on CICD part. So I will move there uh, to the next point. Microservices. So this is uh, the next day of practices. Uh, so not uh, many are familiar with this uh, microservices practice or not many are uh, generally aware that this is a part of the DevOps lifecycle itself there. So generally people assume that, okay, this is just a part of the development team, but no, uh, I would like to really emphasize and, and uh, stress on the point that microservices is generally are like, it's an architectural approach, but at the same time, our operations team or even testing uh, or the quality engineering team or the team members should definitely be aware of what this microservices architecture or the practices. It helps them to make sure how the underlying infrastructure needs to be deployed. It helps them to understand what are the different uh, use cases they should be building to test that entire uh, artifacts which are generated from uh, CICD stage there. So what is microservices? Uh, it is an architectural approach to building software. This architects an application as a collection of loosely coupled and independently deployable services there. So this is, I, I, like, I specifically highlighted this portion, which is like a loosely coupled and independently deployable services. So earlier uh, in an old fashioned model, the entire application is deployed as an, like, an monolithic uh, approach there. So there are no uh, smaller units or uh, that is not modularized in a certain way that the functionality it's the, uh, specific functionality is divided into a smaller level services, which we call here as a microservices there. And each of that microservices component is basically serving and a very specific functionality or helping to solve some kind of problem of that entire application there. And, and which is very loosely coupled and that can be deployed independent or irrespective of how the other things are deployed there. It brings up certain challenges. We quickly touch base on those challenges as well there. But the important point uh, we should keep focusing on or we should be getting familiar here is that microservices practices is more about dividing your application or architecting your application in a such a way that it's a collection of loosely coupled and independently deployable services there. And each of that unit we call as a microservices components there. And when we start thinking about these microservices in the initial part of the development cycle, it will help you to embrace the CICD pipeline very quickly and it will help you to understand the advantages which CICD uh, practices provides you there. Yeah. So that there are certain uh, cultural changes needs to happen in that entire uh, team as well there. Because when we think about or uh, when we start uh, uh, focusing more on this microservices aspect. So it is not only in one team which needs to make a change there or which needs to think about how the application needs to be architected there. So the defective implementation of this architecture style does expect the way the engineers on the team works there. But as I said, when we have a loosely coupled individual unit which serve only a specific functionality, the way the development team needs to architect or start their thought process before even actually writing the code, it will differ from the earlier models. Yeah. So this is a, a graphical representation of uh, moving away from an earlier uh, or traditional monolithic approach to a microservices architecture. So in, in, in the typical uh, or the old fashioned architecture, if you see, we generally follow the MVC architecture, model view and controller where we have an interface team different where uh, that is an entire one unit. Then we have a business logic unit or uh, one binary or application which entirely detects the business logic there. And if you see on the right side part of the screen there, so here there are not a very bigger pieces there. If you see there are like small, small boxes, which is like, uh, we call it, we are uh, showing here as a microservices there. So this microservice 
will be or can be a small part of a business logic. It could be a part of the UI part or it could be a part of the data layer itself also there. So what, what it means that their entire applications is divided into a small, small, loosely coupled microservices and, and that microservices component or unit is nothing but achieving a very specific functionality of that particular applications there. So uh, as I said, uh, when we start moving or we start following this microservices architecture, there are certain challenges comes into the picture because when we divide each functionality into a small, small units there, how do we make sure, how do we expose all these services to an outside world? Or how does one unit or one microservices talk to each other there? So this is, uh, uh, Again, a, a, a diagrammatic representation of that particular challenges here. We will not go in much details about it here, uh, about what are those challenges. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, so the services, how do they communicate each other? If they're communicating to each other, what is the protocol they are following there? And, and what is the underlying infrastructure which will be used for inter-service communication there? And how do we manage or even orchestrate that, orchestrate that entire service to service communication. So there are different tools, there are different services which are available, which accomplishes this service to service communication there. So it is just not like communication from one service to another service. It is more about, do we know there is an another service which provides some specific functionality? So how do we discover those services there? So we need to have in some kind of mechanism, we need to have some kind of tools, which will help you to know, which will help you to discover there is some service which provides this functionality. So what is the address of that particular service? So there is a concept called a service discovery. And once we know there is a service available, once we know there is an endpoint available through which I can get this particular functionality or service there, how do I communicate there? So service discovery and service communication are really, really a very important piece of this microservices practices there. So I will just stop there, uh, uh, that discussion because the more we go into that particular uh, part of discussion, uh, it gets into a much more complex part there. And I'm just trying to limit, uh, I, I just wanted to highlight those concepts and, and leave the rest of the parts for the audience or like all of us to like dig more on that side so that it will help you to understand how those concepts are helping the microservices and knowing how does microservices plays and roll into an entire DevOps lifecycle there. So moving next, uh, so what are uh, some of the services uh, which are provided by AWS on that side? So we know, or like most of the people are familiar with uh, container orchestration services like uh, Kubernetes, open source Kubernetes environment. Uh, so from an AWS point of view, it provides two container orchestration services. One is Elastic Container Service, which most of us are familiar by an ECS name. And then they do have an, a managed upstream uh, Kubernetes functionality or uh, the entire package available through another service, which is Elastic uh, Kubernetes service there. We call it an EKS there. And App Mesh is an, a service mesh functionality uh, provided by an, uh, AWS. What it does, it basically helps you at an application level networking, basically service to service communication there. And then we do have a Lambda, which provides you a serverless computing uh, functionality there. Then we have a cloud map. As I mentioned that, if you are dividing that entire architecture into a small, small microservices, how do we know or how does one component or microservices knows that there's an another service which is available? So that discovery is provided by AWS through a cloud map service there. And then everybody is aware of okay, Route 53. So I have highlighted Route 53 here uh, because Cloud Map uh, on the back end uses Route 53 to understand, okay, this particular service, if I have to reach to this particular service, what is that endpoint? So that endpoint is nothing but your Route 53. Uh, that endpoint is provided by a Route 53 service. there. And uh, moving next uh, is uh, infrastructure as a code there. So this is again a very important and very critical uh, part of the practice of DevOps philosophy there. So we know earlier uh, that the operations team or the infrastructure team generally works uh, separately from the development team there. But with DevOps, uh, there is a cultural change, there is an 
uh, way we need to think about infrastructure needs to be changed. And, and that change come uh, when we start working on a cloud infrastructure there. Because generally when we have an on-premises hardware, uh, then development teams generally prefer to work in a different model and the operations teams take care of the infrastructure by themselves there. But with infrastructure as a code, uh, uh, which is generally or majorly used on uh, the cloud environment or the applications which are cloud natives there, this is help. This is where the infrastructure as a code helps there. Because what it says that uh, we, need, we expect the infrastructure to be created using some kind of code there. So we are creating in templates, we are creating in resources using in some programming languages there. There are different services, different uh, uh, project or different applications which are available, which we, which helps you to create the infrastructure using code there. So what is this infrastructure as a code? What it helps, it helps you to provision, configure and manage your infrastructure resources using code and templates there. As I said earlier, or even in uh, nowadays uh, in the projects or in the companies where most of their infrastructure is on-premises, this is generally not followed, but in cloud native applications or wherever a team started focusing on uh, AWS, Azure, or Google, or any cloud environments there, they know they can create that infrastructure using code and templates there. So what, what, how, how does it help? So anybody or like the even current software development team, they can create the infrastructure the way they want or as per the specific requires, requirements there. Earlier, there are two different teams. So what used to happen, the development team is giving a requirement to your operations team or the infrastructure team saying that, okay, this is the infrastructure you should create it there. So there are always chances that, and, there, and, and that is one of the major roadblock which many teams face is that the application which is running very well in the development environment doesn't work smoothly or as it is into the production environment because there are differences between the actual development environment and the production environment there. So using infrastructure as a code philosophy or the practices, what is happening, the infrastructure which is available for a development purpose and even for a pre-prod, prod or the other environment, it is exactly the same. And how do we make sure that the environment is exactly the same? It is happening through infrastructure as a code there. So there are different, uh, as I said, there are different applications, services which are provided. Uh, so through which you can actually write code to create your infrastructure there. And so what, what does, how, how does it help to a next level? It is not only for a development or the deployment purpose. It helps you to monitor your infrastructure very closely. So when we say monitor, so there are like compliances, HIPAA compliances and few other compliances. So different company, different client, different projects are the different uh, compliances requirement there. So when we know you can create your infrastructure using code, you have a much better control about that entire infrastructure there. You know what resources are getting created. You know what is the config which is getting deployed there. You have a much more tighter control over all those aspects there. And, and when we are creating an infrastructure using code, you know, you can actually write an another piece of code which will validate how the infrastructure is getting created or what is the exact in what, uh, infrastructure which has been created there as well there. And this has been achieved through an infrastructure as a code uh, practice of the DevOps philosophy there. So what it uh, does, so the fundamental principle is to treat the infrastructure the similar way the developer treats the code there. So developers generally just write the code, make sure uh, their code helps to solve application problem there or the customer's problem there. Here, we are going to a next stage. Uh, and what we say is that you write the code, not just to solve the application, uh, not just to uh, write that application or solve, solve some kind of business problem, but you write a code to create an infrastructure as well there. So, so the team, which were earlier just focusing on an application part, now they can very effectively and significantly participate and collaborate with your operations team as well there. And in, and, and in a very ideal and matured uh, day of team, so the same engineer is, uh, is writing an application code and at the same time he is helping to create an infrastructure as well there. And it happens in vice versa also there. So engineers who are early only creating an infrastructure, they can very productively or if it, uh, effectively help your uh, a typical traditional engineering team to even write and 
uh, some pieces of the applications aren't well. So that generally depends upon team to team. But in an ideal situation, that is how your team should form. Uh, the same engineer should be able to uh, write and code for your application. And at the same time, he can even help you to create uh, your infrastructure as well. There. And, and as we discussed, so it, it helps your development team gates and production like uh, productions uh, like environment during the initial phase of the development there because we are creating the entire infrastructure using code. So if you just uh, follow the certain steps, you get the infrastructure as same uh, as uh, the infrastructure which will be deployed into the production there as well. So this is an, uh, a, a graphical representation of this uh, particular practice uh, of infrastructure as in code there. If you see here on the top, DevOps uh, begins with an automation. So any DevOps team or any DevOps project, uh, if they start uh, that particular practice, they know that automation has to be a very core and the central part of this entire uh, particular life, uh, entire project uh, development life cycle there. Without automation, this is not going to help any of uh, the stages, uh, which is helping to faster and reliable delivery of the final products there. So uh, automation is not only with respect to the application or some set of tools, which will do help you for testing purpose, but automation with respect to creating your underlying infrastructure as well there. So if you see on the next, uh, the right side of this particular uh, graphics, you see that the automation needs infrastructure as a code as well there. So what it uh, so with using infrastructure as a code there you can actually even version or even we know what are the initial infrastructure how that infrastructure has been evolved or what are the certain changes have been happen also there and it is very similar or just like the way we are currently or even earlier doing an application development there so your infrastructure is version control it. Uh, and, and, and the infrastructure which has been getting created, it is consistent across different uh, uh, environments as well there. And we can actually test your environment. So when we say we are testing the environment, it basically we are making sure that the infrastructure, what we are creating, it is the exact requirement from a compliance perspective as well there. So what are uh, some of the services which are provided by uh, AWS there? So AWS provides, uh, cloud formation uh, uh, service which helps you to create your infrastructure using code and templates there then we do have an, another service called aws opsworks it is more of a configuration management service so combining a cloud formation and the opsworks what we are doing we are creating an infrastructure and at the same time the application configuration or how the application will be deployed into the infrastructure which is created by cloud formation so that is where the opsworks service helps there so Cloud9 ID it is just a uh, cloud-based uh, ID environment which you can use to create uh, or even write this code and, and test it also there. Good. And, and the next important part uh, of this uh, DevOps practices uh, is monitoring and logging. So earlier uh, in the, the traditional uh, approaches, this was generally and primary uh, part or the responsibility for operations and, and the release team, uh, the operations and the infrastructure team there. But now with end day of changes, uh, we need to make certain changes the way we see the entire life, uh, software uh, development life cycles there. So what it means that, so we need to monitor and observe not only the application, but at the same time, the infrastructure as well there. And this particular practice helps you to record logs monitor the application, as I said, not just an application, but at the same time, infrastructure as well there in the real time. And, and, and that is where continuous monitoring and logging of different metrics, uh, logs generated by the applications, logs generated by infrastructure services as well there, they need to be captured, they need to be streamed to a uh, central repository, and they need to be analyzed and, and get an insights actually how the application is behaving how the infrastructure is behaving, is it as per what we initially thought? If not, then how do we respond or even react to those, those changes there? So all that insights and everything is coming from this particular practice of the DevOps there. And as I said, once we capture uh, and log all of uh, these metrics uh, from an application and infrastructure, 
what it does is that it, it provides you and feedback from an uh, production or uh, any other environments as well there so that uh, you know that so whatever the infrastructure is created and whatever the application is deployed it is exactly the way it is behaving uh, the way we are looking for or it is very close to or truly uh, the exact clients or the users requirement there so when i say a user or client here so there are different stakeholders so it could be a business user who just wanted to make sure that the functional aspect of the application is working as it is if there is an uh, another stakeholder who is uh, more primarily responsible for an infrastructure he will use this particular practice to understand how that infrastructure is behaving there or is it actually the way it should behave or is it actually the way it should get deployed there so different stakeholders uh, gets in different insights as per their primary uh, responsibility there so what it means that it it truly takes you very close to the actual requirement there and in some cases it will help you to understand uh, the behavioral pattern of the users and the infrastructure as well there so when i say behavioral pattern so how does uh, the application how does the infrastructure or how does the end user sees the impact when the load is very high how how does uh, the system reacts when the load is normal how does the system reacts when there is a load below than the normal expected load still so all those metrics you can collect and and you can take a very conscious decisions or you can get an insight from all those metrics there so this particular practice of the devops is helping you to get that behavioral patterns also there and using that behavioral pattern or using those insights you can actually optimize you can take in certain decisions at different levels there uh, and, and it also helps you to uh, scale your infrastructure it helps you to scale your application at run time there so when we know uh, the load on the application is uh, below the normal load then what you can do you can at run time Uh, scale down uh, your infrastructure as well there, or even if there is a load which is below or it is slightly higher than the expected, you can even dynamically scale your infrastructure on that side there. So these are uh, very important services which are provided by AWS, which helps you to do a continuous monitoring and logging on that side. So AWS CloudWatch is like. A must service anybody who is working on not just on AWS side, but anybody who is working on any DevOps project and and that project is getting deployed on cloud native. Considered in this case AWS, you should definitely definitely get familiar yourself with the CloudWatch. Not just get familiar, get much more uh, in depth expertise and knowledge on the CloudWatch there. And then next service is CloudTrail. It basically helps you to track users and the resource activity. by recording uh, the console actions and the api calls there as i uh, as we discussed in the last practice which is infrastructure as a code we are creating your infrastructure using code there so when we say we are creating it using code basically we are uh, executing some api calls there to create some uh, underlying infrastructures there so this cloud trail helps you to track all those api calls uh, which are getting fired through in some kind of uh, application or some kind of tools which is using those apis there and any activity which is happening on the console it is been tracked through an cloud trail as well there and the third service uh, which is part of this particular practice is uh, aws xray so it is more of a developer tool uh, uh, what i generally see it helps developer to analyze and debug the production and the distributed applications there it gives you an end to end view of the requests which travels through your applications there it gives you an uh, uh, very uh, pictorial representation about that particular request which are happening or which are going through your applications there yeah so this is just an uh, a graphical representation about uh, uh, one of the use case uh, which is available on the aws documentation there i just picked it and and uh, put it here so that you get some better idea about how the cloud watch helps you to continuously monitor continuously log that information and take actions or generates alerts on the data which is logs and metrics which is collected by this particular service there so what is common in in all this uh, different practices what we see there 
So these practices are not uh, just about the tool, but they are equally about culture and the architectural change as well. There. When I say cultural, as I said, earlier teams were working in silos. Uh, they are just passing the request to each other through and some kind of defined protocols there. But here, we do not expect team to be a different, different teams there. So what we expect that the, the team comprises a software engineering team, or the development team, the team uh, comprises uh, the operations engineers as well, uh, and the quality engineers as well, and, and the infrastructure teams as well there. So the team has all of these different engineers that are working very, very closely each other so that the product gets delivered with a better quality, the product gets delivered in a predictable fashion and, and in fast way, faster way as well there. And so what is the next common point across all of this is that, so it helps or it increases the software quality and stability there. So if you just quickly think about uh, all the four uh, practices, what we cover CI, CD, infrastructure as a code, microservices and monitoring and logging, each stage helps you to build the product much better. And, and it helps when you build a product or the software much better, it automatically makes sure that the stability of the software into the, the live environment or into the production environment uh, is much better and it is much stable also there. And the next point is, it is truly agile in nature. Uh, so as Nishikan uh, mentioned in the initial uh, brief discussion or uh, introduction there, so you will always hear that continuous word. So it is agile in nature in such a way that whenever certain uh, patches are committed by a development team or development engineers there, you see that it immediately triggers a, a pipeline on the back end and it immediately do a build test and pushes that into a development environment so that you can see uh, on a live, uh, in a live stage how those commits are getting reflected onto the end products there. And the next very, very important piece is that, uh, the next important message is that uh, I feel personally that team should see most of these DevOps practices together. They should not see these practices individually or separate there. The you should combine all of these practices and see on top of all of these practices and see how does it helps you to build a software in much better fashion? How does it help you to avoid some of the challenges which were available in uh, earlier different lifecycle models there? And at the end of the day, it helps you to get rid of that frustration. Sometimes we feel when we pass that request to a different team and that team takes a long time to deliver or uh, give you uh, the expected end results there. Yeah. Uh, I really wanted to uh, quickly go through you and uh, code pipeline demo there, but I will just take a pause here. I will wait for any questions and uh, Hello. Any questions, any comment till time? Okay, I take that as no. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. Yes, Ajit. So Nishikant, uh, do you want me to go through the actual demo uh, uh, considering the time constraint and everything? Uh, yeah, you, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. So uh, what I will do is that uh, I will just very quickly walk you through uh, the demo which I have prepared, uh, uh, which will help you to understand how some of these practices what we uh, uh, just now gone through or get familiar there, how does it actually seize into the real life there? So what I did, as I mentioned, uh, we are using cloud formation uh, to create an infrastructure there. So uh, just before starting this uh, demo, uh, like today, early in the morning, I created this infrastructure. So what it does, it creates some different resources. If you go here, so you will I see that it creates Basically, you are already creating templates using yes, cloud that's formation, correct. right? That's correct. 
Yeah, so Nishikant will be going in much details about the cloud formation template and few other things. So I'm just like uh, rushing through some of these things uh, uh, so that uh, Nishikant gets an enough time to uh, go in details about the cloud formation as well. There. And you can pull up your code from Git, right? Yes. So there are different ways uh, we can get the uh, code there. Uh, so for testing, like uh, for this demo purpose, what I did, uh, the template which I created here, I am uh, uh, I created that template, I put it into my local system. And when we create this stack, uh, so during the stack, it will uh, ask you from where you wanted to pull this uh, template there. Either you can get the template from S3 or from your local system also there. And on the S3, what you can do on the back end, you can have your uh, uh, source control system in a such a way that whenever the changes are happening on the infrastructure side, you commit those changes. And at the same time, uh, you push those changes to an S3 so that whenever cloud formation picks the template from that particular S3 bucket, it is using the latest copy from there. Then uh, what is the difference here for Git and Jenkins like? Yeah, so, uh, so the difference, there are like different, okay, there are the Jenkins uh, from is an altogether different uh, um, CICD tool there, very widely used there. For this discussion purpose, we are primarily focusing on the AWS side. We what we will do. Uh, so I, I was holding that particular thought is that at the end of this particular session, uh, Nishikant will let you know. So we will be having and very in depth sessions, uh, uh, the meetups going forward in the next new year there, which will talk in much more details about each of these individual components also there. Hello. Okay. Uh, Yes, okay. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, uh, I have already created this particular template. Uh, I have created uh, uh, that particular stack. So, what it is creating? It is creating in different resources, basically a code pipeline. And that code pipeline, if you see here, code pipeline, what it does, uh, it picks up any changes which are happening on the code commit there. And whenever any changes are happening on the code commit, they are basically tracked through an uh, cloud watch rules there. So that cloud watch rule uh, always monitors the code commit repository and any commit which is happening there, what it does, that cloud watch triggers your code pipeline. And once the code pipeline is triggered, what it does, it gets the source code or your uh, the entire uh, source code from an uh, repository. In this case, I'm using an AWS repository. It builds that code. And once the build and everything goes smooth, what it does, it, it deploys that particular uh, artifacts into an environment. So I'm using an AWS code deploy service to deploy that uh, web application onto an EC2 system here for a demo purpose there. Uh, Achy, uh, can you just go to edit for uh, one of the stage, like, you know, uh, that will help. So in the first stage, like, you know, just go edit and uh, can you show us the Git or some repository that you have configured here? Yep. So, okay. So, let me. So, this is the code repository uh, which is uh, configured and I'm using it here. So, if you go here. So, this is a stage, so stage. And if you see the provider, provider is nothing but an from where it will pick up uh, the source code there. So here I'm using an AWS code commit there. It does have a different uh, uh, services from where it can get the source code there. And then uh, I'm using, like I said, I'm using AWS code commit here. Here you can use a Git or any other uh, repositories there. And in that particular uh, AWS code commit, I'm specifically using this uh, my demo repository and I'm using a master branch of that particular repository to uh, build and test that particular thing. And whatever is the, out, uh, uh, the result, uh, the build, which is coming from this particular thing, it gets sourced as output there. Yes, so this is in general uh, equivalent to Bamboo or something, right? Where we actually pull the source code and then build the binaries. That's what the code commit is doing. Yeah. And uh, Anis, uh, like you mentioned that, like uh, what is the difference there? 
So instead of, I will say, focusing on the different diffuse in the initial stage, if you see that this is a similar kind of uh, interface of the functionality is available in the Jenkins also. So you can configure uh, different services from where Jenkins and pull the source, it can build and then push it into the actual uh, deployment environment also. Can you change the, uh, uh, the code to Git and then we could see the parameters? If you Maybe familiar, more familiar to the folks. Can you just uh, open it? So just and, a uh, quick question, Ajit, uh, if you know the answer, like uh, how, how does the pricing model work for this? Is it per repository, per build? How, how does it work? Yeah, so pipeline, uh, uh, so uh, pipeline, like uh, we have configured pipeline service there. So every active pipeline has some cost there. So exact okay. pricing, I am not, I, I don't have it uh, back up my head right now. Uh, key, what the, exactly that pricing is, but for every active pipeline, there will be a cost. Okay. And even for repository, like uh, repository or even code deploy. So there are different pricing models uh, and criteria for each of them. There. Okay. I don't have it that handy to uh, give it to you. Uh, if you need it, I can just like quickly uh, get back to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. Is, uh, run twenty four by seven. Yes. Or... Uh, is it this pipeline uh, run twenty four by seven or when this needed? Yeah. So as I said, uh, if uh, let me just cancel this part to this card. So what I'm doing is that so this pipeline is there but it will not be active unless and until there is some external event which is triggering here. So that external event uh, in this case, so if you go to the cloud formation stack, you will see that it is creating in different resources here. So one of the resources that it is creating an event rule. And if you see this event role and the criteria when this particular cloud watch event will be triggered, what it does, so whenever there are any state changes in the code repository, it should get triggered. Then what is that specific uh, repository on which it is continuously monitoring it? So it is basically monitoring my, uh, my demo repo. What it does, so whenever there is an event which has been created or updated, to the master branch of this particular repository, this event will be triggered. And what this event does, if you come down here, so whenever that event gets triggered, it, it, it passes that event to a target. So in this specific case, that target is nothing but the port pipeline, what we are seeing here. If you see the ERN of this particular uh, pipeline and this one, it is same there. Yeah. Okay. So what happens whenever we are making any changes to the code uh, commit there, so that changes or the event is captured by a CloudWatch and CloudWatch triggers your pipeline. So the pipeline will never be an active 24 by 7 there. It is there, but it will become active whenever any changes are happening in the code repository, which will be then captured by your CloudWatch rule and that CloudWatch rule make the code, line, code pipeline active there. Okay. Uh so just one question about this code pipeline, Ajit. So uh, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, whenever, uh, when we want to build uh, some application, right, to create binaries, we need to install uh, some third party uh, uh, libraries as well uh, to compile and create the binary. So does it also support a similar feature of uh, installing, like before building the application, installing yes. some th third party dependencies? Yes, it does. So it is not a direct functionality to the code pipeline. So what we can do, like I said, code pipeline is just a wrapper or a layer on top of the other services, which is like uh, uh, code deploy, code build and code commit there. So in the deploy stage, the way you want it to deploy, you can uh, make sure that some of those things are taken care of there. So in, in this specific case for the deploy stage, what I did, let me just quickly go to you that part also. So what I did, uh, so in the code deploy stage, I am making sure that the instances which are created 
which has a name my code pipeline so in all those instances so whatever is the artifacts which is generated from an earlier stage will get deployed on all the ec2 instances which has a name my code pipeline demo right now so what you can do so this ec2 instance which you will be creating so in that image itself or maybe in the user data of that ec2 instance you can make sure that some of those dependencies or few other things which you wanted to uh, make available for your actual application get added uh, at that stage itself yeah. Uh, does that help you? Uh, yes, I, 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 I can relate now. Like uh, in build stage, we can have a, yes. a custom kind of uh, logic to for building for deploying as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that is not something which you can directly do in code pipeline itself. That is something we have to make sure the underlying resources or the infrastructure which is available, it has all of those things done there. Uh, so or just we, just as an example. Can, uh, so <laughs> when we are trying to build something, uh, so is it built on uh, EC2 or it, uh, code uh, like uh, code pipeline has its own like it creates uh, its own container and tries to build uh, within that container? Yes, so it has a different platforms available, so you can choose any of the platform, and then that platform uh, will dictate what are the things which are available on uh, for you there. Okay, okay, makes sense. Good. Okay, so I will just go ahead here. So if you see right now this pipeline, okay, let me just see. Here. So this pipeline was triggered like almost a hour before, and if you see the final page, currently it is saying congratulations meter one there. So what I did, uh, uh, so the code commit repository, I have a replay. I have cloned it on uh, one of the other EC2 instance. And then what I will be doing, I will just go here. I will change from now earlier, uh, it was a congratulation meta V1. I will say congratulation meta V2 here. And then I save my changes. I put my changes into the staging area. Okay, and then I'm committing those changes. And then I am making sure, uh, so whatever changes we did, which are available in our working directory right now, they are pushed to our code commits there. Now the changes are pushed to code commit. So what should happen? The CloudWatch will sense there is some changes happening to code repository. And the moment it since that changes has happened, it will trigger this code pipeline there. So if you see right now, the CloudWatch has sent there are certain changes. So as far as we as a software engineering team is concerned, we haven't done anything there. We just pushed our changes there. The moment changes are pushed there, what is happening? So the underlying infrastructure or the pipeline which has been created there, it sends all those changes. Uh, it compiles automatically, which is nothing but our CI/CD stage there. Uh, it, it, and once that compilation goes well, uh, whatever the uh, testing, unit testing, and uh, some of the things we are putting in place there that goes smooth, then what we'll be doing, we are making sure that, so that code is compiled properly and whatever is the final result, it gets deployed into a right environment. So here uh, on the beta stage, what we are seeing on the screen right now, what I'm doing, I am, uh, uh, putting that particular index.html to an EC2 instance, which is getting deployed from this particular pipeline there. If you see right now, so the beta stage, uh, which is basically a your deployment stage, it succeeded here. If you see the time here, it's just now there. Now, earlier we were saying here V1. So if you refresh this page, we should see here it is in V2. Yep, that's it. So this is what I wanted to show you as a part of the demo. Uh, which is actually uh, giving you a very quick uh, idea about how the CI CD works, uh, how the infrastructure as a code works there. So th through this demo, I'm not able to uh, show you or provide you much more details with respect to the microservices and monitoring and logging part, which we covered in, in theoretical aspects there. Uh, but with the given constraint and, and the things, I just created this simple application so that you get a sense of the CI CD at least there. And you get a sense about how these things can work in the real environment there.
Okay, so I will take a pause here and we'll wait for any questions or any comments on uh, some of the things what we covered here. So if any changes is happened, so uh, this is reflecting CloudWatch. So as well as SNS uh, will also work here. Like uh, you have uh, any changes uh, will made. So you have uh, received notification on your mail using SNS service, right? Okay, but how does the SNS know that, okay, there are certain changes which are happening in the code repository? So you can, I, 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 right now, I don't have an idea whether SNS can actually, or like code repository can be configured uh, so that any changes are happening that gets to SNS there. If that uh, functionality or feature is available yes. in the code unit, what you are saying, that will work. The way I have uh, created this application uh, for a demo purpose, what I'm doing, I'm using CloudWatch to uh, uh, monitor those events there. Yes, if the SNS or the code commit has that functionality, what you are saying definitely makes sense and can be achieved as well. Yes, so actually SNS is more of a notification service, right? So depending on the event and uh, it uh, can be confirmed like it directly at attached with the code commit, I mean, the code deploy in the, the pipeline. But definitely as you could assume there is a CloudWatch event, uh, we can listen to that CloudWatch event and you know, try and trigger a SNS. So if it's not even a default implementation, it's just about, uh, you know, waiting for an event. That's all this eventless system, you know, uh, actually uh, event-based system actually make it work. So they're totally decoupled. They're just waiting there to be triggered. If someone triggers them, they go to activate themselves and execute the code, right? So it's it's can be done definitely. Okay. It's more of an, an architectural decisions you need to consider whether SNS, SNS or whether it is a cloud watch, which fits very well uh, into the overall architecture of the applications there. So those are some of the questions we should be asking it into the initial stage of uh, creating this entire infrastructure there. So how this CICD is uh, work for the container service like EKS? Okay, so, uh, so in, in this specific case, uh, considering AWS specifically, so the code deploy uh, does have an, a different deployment target. So uh, for this particular demo purpose, I have used EC2 as a uh, target system, but it can deploy those artifacts onto the ECS as well. There. So can we integrate this code pipeline with EKS? Yes, ECS. I think EKS is doesn't, I am not sure whether EKS has recent support, but whatever I checked, I think code deploy has only support for EC2, then ECS and the Lambda functions there. What you can do, you can push those uh, uh, artifacts created into an, your ECR registry, which is your container registry. And then EKS can be configured in a such a way that it pulls up the latest container image there. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any other questions or comment? Okay, so I will move forward. We have few things which we need to cover. So this is with respect to code deploy, uh, code pipeline. Okay, so, so there are different uh, deployment strategies. Uh, when I say deployment strategies, it is about uh, in the CICD, we uh, just discussed right now that how the, uh, the artifacts will be deployed uh, onto and targets there. So we know that okay, the, the artifacts can be deployed onto the target, but how we wanted to deploy uh, those targets there. So there are different strategies uh, which are used and depending on uh, your project's requirement, uh, any of this will fit into in your actual requirement there. So I will just quickly go through these deployment strategies. So you get in, uh, you get in familiar uh, uh, with some of these uh, strategies and you can uh, use depending on your actual requirement in, in your projects there. The first one is uh, recreate or all at once deployment. Uh, so it basically what it does that, uh, so target which will be deployed, which will be, uh, it will be freshly created and, and the final app 
final product or the software release will be deployed on that uh, newly created infrastructure there. And the next is uh, more about rolling. Uh, so when we say in rolling, it is more about uh, one instance will be, uh, or like there are like different instances of your uh, processors or the applications there. What it will do, it will do an deployment for only one instance. When the deployment happen, it goes well, then it will destroy uh, that particular instance from the existing infrastructure and the applications which is available from a new infrastructure will be serving your request there. So that is very quick on, on the rolling part. And in a similar way, uh, it will terminate and it will uh, start using the newly created uh, target systems there. In the canary deployment, it is more of uh, what it will do. Uh, so instead of passing all 100% traffic or the request to an existing infrastructure, what it will do, it will create a new infrastructure or the new deployment there. And some part of your request will go to this uh, uh, new deployment there. And slowly, slowly, once you are comfortable, testing is done, there are no unexpected issues observed, then the entire 100% of your existing infrastructure will be removed from an, uh, the target environment and only the instances or the targets which we are created will be available for serving the request there. Then we have a blue green deployment, which is very commonly and frequently used in most of the deployment. So what it does is that so blue is nothing but your existing uh, environment or the deployment there. And green is your new deployment, which will be having the latest release of your applications there. So we will be having both this environment created and at one stage, uh, the blue will be replaced entirely by a green and the user will just see green environment there. In uh, uh, AB testing, it is an, uh, another deployment strategies, which is very similar to uh, blue green, uh, the one the canary deployment. Uh, the only major difference with the AB testing is that, so the new release is only available to a certain subset of the users in a certain conditions there. So it has a very well, uh, I will say structured and, uh, and and at the same time we are making sure that the new release is available only to uncertain users in a very specific conditions there. That is not the case with the canary develop, uh, deployment there. So this is just a pictorial uh, uh, representation of what we just discussed in the recreate deployment uh, strategy. If you see right now uh, the user is connecting to the V1 when we are using recreate uh, deployment strategy, all the requests just will go to the V2. And when the requests start going to V2, the entire V1 section will be terminated there. Then into the rolling environment, as I said, not the entire existing target environment will be removed. What we do, we will start uh, uh, removing one instance at a time. And that one instance will be uh, uh, replaced by a new release once it functions properly the same iterative model will be followed for all the instances of the processes there. Uh, and then uh, Canary, uh, as I mentioned in the Canary, what we do, we are not removing the V1 uh, immediately there. In the initial phase, what happens, instead of passing all the 100% traffic to the V1, what we do, we pass on some percentage of the all the requests to an existing environment and some portion we pass it to the V2 so that we test, we know that everything is going really well. And once uh, we, uh, the deployment team or the release team is uh, having that confidence that okay, the V2 is working as expected, there are no uh, unforeseen issues coming into that deployment, then the V1 will be uh, removed from the actual uh, environment there. In the blue green environment, what it happens is that we create a similar kind of environment to the underlying infrastructure only with a new release of the software there. It is available at the same time uh, for uh, initial phase. Once uh, the infrastructure team or release team or this entire DevOps team is uh, confident that, okay, everything is well tested, everything is properly deployed there, then the V2 will be entirely removed at once and all the traffic will go to the new environment and which is nothing but your uh, green deployment or the latest release of your applications and software there. In the A-B testing, uh, as I mentioned, it is uh, very close to or uh, similar to uh, blue-green. The major difference is here that the V2 is available only for some set of users in a very specific conditions. So if you see here, 
we see two actors and one actors or like some set of actors are still using the v1 and only some actors or like stakeholders or the end users are started using v2 in a very specific conditions only and once everything goes well then v1 will be removed and then the traffic entire traffic will be moved to and v2 version there So from an uh, AWS perspective, uh, so I think I was answering to Anish or, some, Anish or someone else question. So what are the different deployment strategies and the targets available here? So this particular chart uh, is uh, more towards the core deploy AWS service here. So most of or the different deployment strategies acts on different services or the different targets. So for ECS, everything, all the deployment strategies works as it is there. Even same thing for Lambda. But when it comes to uh, that artifacts needs to be deployed on uh, the EC2 instance or on premises, not all the deployment strategies are currently supported. In future, it may be supported, but the current stage is that it only supports the in place and the blue green there. Even for the blue green deployment stage, uh, it is not available for uh, on premises there. The blue green deployment strategy only works with AWS EC2 instances there. So on, on the second row or the third row, what you are seeing on the screen, on the blue green against the AWS EC2 on-premises, on even though it is marked as on-check, uh, the checked one, uh, but there is, uh, I, I think I missed to put a star there and that star basically indicates that the blue green deployment strategy only works with AWS EC2 instances and not with uh, on-premises instances there. Yeah, so that's uh, pretty much from my end. Uh, I will take a pause here. If you have any questions, comment, I will answer it. Otherwise, uh, I will hand it over to Mr. Gandhi. Uh, hi, did Nirmal here. Yeah, hello. Uh, I had a question like how, how different is like uh, blue green uh, uh, deployment strategy uh, compared to the recreate or the all at once? Because they both uh, in a way looks pretty similar, the strategies. So if you go back here, this is blue green. So if you see, both of these environments are available here. So both the environments are available at the same time. What happens is that, so your traffic is only routed to a newer version or the newer environment once the testing and your deploy, uh, infrastructure team is very well satisfied with there. So at one point, what will happen you will have uh, underlying resources created uh, for both the environment. So there is some kind, uh, some aspect of the cost will come into the picture. So how long that testing or that initial phase will go on, that will dictate the total cost which your team can bear there. In the recreate environment or all at once, what is happening, we are creating it for a very short period of time. And the moment uh, it is deployed there, uh, at the same time, the V1 will be deployed there. So the deployment strategies needs to be considered with respect to how long you are having, how much downtime uh, is uh, permitted or is allowed for during the deployment stage. And the second important factor is about a cost factor there. If you have a much bigger deployment uh, environment, then the cost which will be considered for a blue green will be a significant cost there. But when it comes to recreate, what will happen the, there for a very short period of time, there will be like, the underlying infrastructure, both the infrastructure will be available, but for a very short duration, because we're just cutting it immediately there. But with the blue green, we are keeping it for a substantial amount of time. There. Okay, yeah, got it, yeah, thanks. Yep, thank you, Nirman. Uh, any questions, any other comments? Yep. Uh, Thank you all. Uh, back to you, Nishkan. Thanks, Rajit. Uh, looks on the word it really simple, but when you actually get into the details of each and every term, definitely it's you know worth nothing. Thanks for explaining that. So let me share my screen. Okay. Can you stop screen. sharing? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, guys. So geared up. Uh, so we have maybe. Yeah, around, yeah, we can cover that up, okay, sure. So, uh, you know, AWS IAC, like infrastructure as a code. So, 
that's what we are going to focus next, like which are the services, uh, what AWS offers. And in terms of a data lake implementation, uh, we'll see how the CDK works. And I'm telling in advance, we might just overshoot by 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I request you to stay along because more inter-system is coming up. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, SDK is like software development kit. It has been existed since long, but again, it's a lot of, even though it's code, it's more of a manual, uh, not that much configuration oriented and um, takes a lot of time to develop. That's how uh, AWS itself then switched to a cloud formation where there is a more declarative way of defining how your infrastructure should look like in terms of AWS resources, their parameterization, their life cycle. Okay. And the cloud formation has been exist and it's still a base where most of these uh, infrastructure piece are getting instantiated even across multiple AWS services. And that's what we'll see uh, in demo. On top of it, uh, there are some difficulties when working with the cloud formation and that's where the CDK was invented. It's, uh, it's a definitely a comparatively new offering from AWS, uh, it's like year and a half at max. So we'll see it's uh, definitely good, uh, matured a lot and there's a lot of traction around how people use CDK to go develop. It's again a cloud development kit. So let's get started. So yeah, so cloud formation, what exactly it is, right? I mean, of course we are forming something on a cloud, but what exactly that mean? So for example, if you uh, see AWS term itself, so it's more of a web service, right? Amazon web services. So definitely it's back with a lot of API, right? And what happens, this API are actually again configured to instantiate infrastructure. So for example, let's say if we interact with, uh, you know, if you want to create an EC2 instance, then all we need to do is like uh, EC2 run instance call. And uh, of course, choosing AMI and particular configuration, then the uh, AWS infrastructure itself will instantiate that EC2 and give us the you know information back to us so that we can go log in and do our uh, business processing over there. So we'll, we'll see some of the templates. So what exactly the cloud formation API is, right? So be, behind the scenes are like really very simple, uh, you know, the stack APIs. So when I say stack, it's a collection of resources actually playing together, okay? So for example, uh, as I said, it's Amazon Web Services, AWS itself, for each and every piece, there are humongous web services and those are uh, you know, scalable, those are unit oriented, but if you see the application, those are built on top of a lot of these services communicating to each other, right? And that's where the stack makes sense, where you define your logical, you know, uh, application and the group of services that you're going to interact with and how they should interact within themselves. So basically in nutshell, there is only three API that, you know, cloud formation does execute like create, update and delete, just like any resource. And the, the reason it gets really more interesting because now you can visualize infrastructure as just a code, right? Just like a, a web service, for example, a REST API, for example. So when we say like we are uh, applying the software development cycles, the best practices, it has to be a code and it has to be the way uh, we have seen in the screen. So there is nothing else, there's nothing fancy. It's just about how this logical grouping of a services go talk to each other and then how we actually deploy using create stack how do we update maintain their life cycle and once the things are done we we go delete it and we do it very repetitive way when it comes to uh, integration testing uh, you know the pre production testing and when we actually deploy on a production so just about the same api with the different configuration getting called and that's how you will able to relate more why it is called infrastructure as a code because that's what we do in a code right so what that mean, what that barely mean, what does a cloud formation template look like, right? So this is very minimal things that you would need to instantiate a bucket. So S3 bucket, everybody knows it. So what we are going to do is this is a simple YAML and cloud formation support JSON file as well. So this is a YAML template of it. Uh, we have to define a version, the optional description and in the resources section, like, uh, you know, this is my bucket name. I am telling this, like, this is again namespace for cloud formation. I'm telling them, okay, this is a type of a S3 bucket. And uh, among the properties, because if you go to the S3 bucket, there are like a lot many properties are given in terms of uh, who should access his resource-based policies, 
you know, should it be public and not? And I'm just defining my bucket should be public. So that's the bare minimal a cloud formation template will look like for a typical S3 bucket. And once I'm defined my configuration, like what I really need to do infrastructure as a code, what I'm going to do is like, you know, create stack. So this is uh, AWS cloud formation, again, a command line based, uh, you know, utility where I can say create stack, uh, give my stack a name. Uh, I'm kept it like same, but I could have given different. And then I'm just, uh, you know, replay my template body, like which stack, which configuration I want to go deploy and with which name. That's all the bare minimal cloud formation template thing does. Okay. So uh, I'll request if, if there are any questions, just call it out because in interest of time, I'll be uh, not rushing through, but at least I'll like to go as much as speed as I can. Okay. So yes. So basically what are the cloud formation, other things which are available. So I understand, okay, resources, one type that we saw where we actually, you know, go configure type, there are properties particular to that resource. Uh, then there are, you know, depends on. So if you are like multiple resources in the uh, template, how's the life cycle looks like, which resource should be created before the others. That's what this depends on attribute does. And then there are creation, deletion policy, update policy. So as and when the cloud formation actually invoke, create, update, delete APIs, what kind of things you really want your resource to go through, that's what you can go configure here in these policy sections. So apart from the resources, and this is the only minimal requirement for a cloud formation template to be valid, there are, okay, so basically there are two of them. One is a version and then the resources. But uh, after this two, rest of the properties are actually more advanced and those are optional. I will just quickly go through and how it make, and how it allows us to uh, do cloud formation more template basis, okay? So there, there are parameters just like environment parameters. So when you see things as a code, uh, you can pass the parameters to it, right? So if let's say, if there's a, object and there's a function, you can pass on the parameters so that at runtime, the function behavior will change. And same way uh, we can pass the parameters to the cloud formation template. And there are uh, typical validation thing that we can put like, you know, uh, like allowed values. So it should be between either dev test prod or what kind of pattern should be allowed. So this is typically for, you know, a subnet pattern that we can uh, put. So the cloud formation validates when it is instantiating a stack. Okay. So the, once the parameter is done, uh, then there's like, you know, mapping. So uh, you can, so these are like singular parameters and their validations, right? But if you have to pass up a, a set of information, like as a key map, key and a value map. So that's where this mapping does, uh, where we can uh, pass a reference to a map and then it can actually go take uh, AWS region uh, from any of value from that map. So where it is used, like uh, you don't want to, hard code a region, but you will uh, deploy this stack in any one and then it can go, this is a ready-made uh, function from a cloud formation. It will just go create, uh, pick up any region actually. So, sorry. Then there are like conditions, like uh, if you need a prod, uh, if, if you really want some source of uh, resources should be created on production only. So there is a conditions is also uh, supported like uh, environment should be prod only or dev only, and then you can, uh, in the same template, can handle the multiple prod, dev, and you know, uh, integration or you know, UAT test kind of scenarios. Uh, after all this done, uh, as I said, once we submit a request, of course, there will be output, right? Just like any uh, code, like if you uh, call a function, you get output, even if it's a null, it's output. So on the same sense, whenever we deploy anything on a cloud formation, it gives us output, and that generally, have uh, information about uh, what you really taken as a parameter from that uh, execution and as well as what the stack ID it actually created and deployed. So we'll see how, how this uh, all play together uh, moving forward. Okay, so uh, we have seen the cloud formation. We have seen the kind of different attribute and structure it support. Now let's see in a single template, if we, I, if I go develop all the things, including my pipeline, including my, you know, the uh, application layer, web layer, uh, my database tier, if everything I configured in a one, 
file, it will be definitely non-maintainable because uh, the resources, this, the tags are like really too much. So what the cloud formation based practices suggest is to divide the application across various stack so that they get more maintainable, right? But even if we go do that, actually they are dependent at runtime. So for example, if there's a, a middleware, uh, you know, stack which actually create a JVM or you know Java application, and there is a database level stack where it has to actually go talk, uh, you know, the database resides in a private subnet. So for one stack to able to reach to other stack, there is a provision so that we can use these values across the stacks. So we are not duplicating our code and still we are able to segregate the logical definition of that stack, what they should do. And one example over here is like, uh, believe this, like, this is one of my stack where I am uh, creating a subnet, I uh, configure the properties and uh, as output, as I mentioned, output is one of the section in cloud formation template. What I'm going to do here is uh, this is my actually key and I'm referencing value as a public subnet one. So you can imagine like this is the my uh, resource name. And when I say export, uh, after I run this cloud formation, this value is actually exported as, as a one of the parameter at runtime. And if I have to use this public subnet in uh, you know my web tier, uh, maybe inside you know EC2 auto scaling group, for example. So that's how I can actually go and say like you know import value, and the key has to be same. And the cloud formation itself will be intelligent enough to understand, okay, you know, I have to take this value from this template and whatever the runtime value is populated for the subnet ID, it will pass along for a web tier. So that's how you are, uh, even though segregating your development, your cohesiveness is maintained, but you are still able to share the information at runtime. Okay. And uh, one of the really typical thing, uh, like, of course we have to, uh, work with the parameter stores. And one of the reason is uh, nobody would like to hard code the password, right? We are, we are talking about infrastructure as a code. We are talking about the work based practices. And of course, uh, uh, even if it's possible to have all the password and other thing in a code, uh, which will be revisioned, will which will be monitored. It's not, not, it's not best practice to keep secrets inside the code itself. So one of the provision that cloud formation provides is uh, we can put all these parameters. So SSM, you know, parameter store is one of the resource. Uh, what you can do is like, you know, uh, define up uh, like, you know, uh, one of the resource, like, you know, web uh, minimum size, uh, like, you know, these are auto scaling group uh, minimum size. Uh, I'm, what I'm referring it as a SSM parameter and I'm giving some properties as a, you know, one. And again, just like the last format, I'm outputting this I am referring my, you know, uh, the keyword, the resource name, and I'm exporting it as a value. So this is how I export this into SSM parameter store. But when it comes to using it into another template, uh, there is a, a different provision cloud formation where I can say resolve, and it it will go it's import that value into this template at runtime. Okay. So the pattern that we see is like sharing information across the stack. And uh, this pattern actually talks about uh, maintaining your secrecy correctly. So there is no hard coding. Uh, yes, uh, obviously the resource uh, or the stack which is going to use this parameter store has to have a read access to a secret manager as a part of a role who is going to instantiate that task stack. And uh, this stack has to have a write permission to the parameter store uh, so that it should able to write it to the you know, parameter. Okay. So moving along, uh, yes, there will be like a lot of uh, templates around, but how do we go validate? Because at one point of time, it will be like really too much information. So to help you out, there are different tools. And uh, what they might help you, they help you is like, if they're like missing required for a resource properties, because every property has so much details to cover, if you like really missed out the uh, important ones. So you can treat it like, uh, these are like mandatory parameters to a function. For example, if you miss that out, uh, your compiler should complain, right? So that's how we are uh, looking cloud formation as a template, as a code, and that's why this property is really important. And there are tools which can help you out. Then of course there'll be, there could be syntax error, typos, you know, resource property names, uh, because this is not uh, actually, even though we are treating as a code, this is not a type compatible, uh, like type check, 
type checking is not happening, right? Yeah. Then there could be like non-existent resource property values, like, you know, things that really doesn't exist, but you are referring to, or maybe, you know, the invalid, uh, maybe you missed a header or some, you know, yeah. and having all that. Uh, so, somebody can put on a mute, actually. Thank you. So, uh, to handle all this kind of validation, and as Ajit suggested, like you know, they're like unit, unit, having a best practice a unit and uh, test integration suites. So there is a utility called uh, CFN Lint, which actually help you to do all this. And on top of it, if you define some resource and you are trying to deploy it to a different region where that resource doesn't exist, CFN Lint will help you catch that. Okay, so this is more of a unit testing thing where you are actually not instantiating infrastructure, but making sure that all uh, diligence in terms of validity of that template can be you know, taken care. And uh, Taskcat is a tool which help you actually go execute the integration test. So here, uh, when I say integration, of course, uh, the stacks are actually deployed. Uh, you can de define your expectation from that uh, infrastructure stack, like, you know, there should be how many VPCs, there should be, uh, you know, this year, there should not be uh, any public VPC, private VPC. So all kind of thing you can define as a test and then you can go execute. These two tools actually work very nicely with the cloud formation and uh, we'll see one of the small implementation like how you can go customize this. So uh, the lint, the CMFN lint that we talked about, uh, you can actually create your own rules. So it doesn't just uh, limited by its own rule set, you can really go create your own tools, own rules, uh, sorry. So uh, basically these rules are nothing but fancy. Those are like really simple. Those are simply a Python scripts. So uh, as you could see, I actually imported some, you know, uh, packages and uh, I have a class name, uh, RDS deletion policy. It has a rule ID, a short description and a function. So it, uh, here it's your custom business logic goes and we'll see the one implementation of it fairly quickly. So for example, I, I have to catch if, uh, you know, if I allowed, uh, like, you know, deletion policies should be specified, okay? And it, it should be, you know, deletion uh, policy for that particular RDS resource should set to snapshot or written. So it's not optional, you know, it, it should be something around a snapshot or written. So basically what it's doing is it has an empty you know, dictionary, then it's trying to get all the resources uh, from the DB instance. It's iterating over that resources, it's trying to see if there is you know, a policy, policy like deletion, deletion policy, and it's trying to see the resource name, and if there is a no, it's just adding, okay, uh, it does not have a deletion policy, or if it's uh, having, uh, you know, if it's not snapshot or written, if it's a delete, then uh, actually you uh, put a message like, okay, it, it should have at least, you know, uh, deletion policy set to snapshot or return. And how does it helps? Like uh, by default, nobody will able to set any of the RDS instance uh, which has deletion policy except these two. Okay, so you're actually creating your own rule depending on your uh, the infrastructure expectations that you have. Okay. And uh, we can actually uh, go at this rule when we are creating, uh, when you are actually deploying the cloud formation template and they will help you to add more validation to your infrastructures. So again, uh, cloud formation itself has a one new cool feature called change set because as Ajit mentioned, you'll be doing it a lot often. The software deliveries, small changes, you have to uh, test many things in a, very recurrent and continuous manner. So how do we actually understand who did what, what kind of uh, expectations are from the particular change set? This uh, happens not completely automated, but this generally happens to a production deployment where uh, you define a stack just like any normal stack, as you could see here, and then you define a change set over it. So what CloudFormation does, it actually introspect and it tells you what actually going to change. So what the version one, the existing version and what the next version would look like, what are the differences that you can actually go understand. And then somebody at that authority can take a, a decision whether they really want to go deploy this or they just you know cancel this. 
so it generally uh, doesn't happen to often but if there are like important uh, production scenarios where you actually go do and those are really very critical uh, this is where they go check to understand what's the recall patient recall patient for that you know uh, particular cloud formation deployment uh, okay so there is new not new but uh, one of the cool feature is like stack set so we understand the previous one was change set, right? So it talk about a particular cloud formation change and it gives you an overview of what it does. But what what would happen if there are multi-organization, multi-account de deployment? This is again at very high level, uh, but that's where the stack set tool help where uh, you, so imagine you're like uh, in a administration, like the, the sole administration of the uh, company, and then you have a target uh, different accounts within your organization or a different organization so you can actually define the stack set and then a particular application or a copy of that application which is you know shared among different uh, uh, accounts you can go deploy that very confidently and what are the benefits the stack set provides is one of them is uh, like you know how many maximum concurrent accounts you want to go deploy uh, what the strategy for failure tolerance and if, if something goes wrong uh, do you really want to uh, retain the previous tags or not uh, basically how does it help uh, we we'll again uh, unfortunately in interest of time we'll not get into many details but basically there are two accounts one is governing account which has cloud formation stack set administration and the other like target account where we actually go deploy this it's like cloud formation stack set execution role so with this two feature, you get a from flexibility to go deploy your changes uh, in a multiple accounts, multiple organizations as a, as a one deployment. And this is really a very cool feature where high level, but definitely uh, important one when you have multi-organization, multi-account deployments. Okay, so uh, it again, good and most demanded feature if you see the cloud formation lifecycle is how we go and develop custom resources. So we understand cloud formation is a stack of resources, which AWS has a namespace for. But if you assume uh, you, you work on on-prem, you really uh, need to uh, handle some resources on on-prem basis as well, as a part of your stack inside a cloud formation. So uh, there, there's where the, these are like extension to, to the cloud formation. Uh, those are called custom resources. And the life cycle over here is like, you know, user define everything in a cloud formation stack, and uh, you know that uh, actually cloud formation put into a stacks of uh, a live ongoing uh, this stacks on the cloud formation infrastructure what it does uh, it has uh, just like create so basically see here even if it's a custom resource if you see it as a code all you can do with the other resource on the ecosystem is to create update and delete right so basically all this uh, create update delete behavior actually mentioned into a lambda then Lambda talks to that external system, uh, make sure all the changes and everything is get deployed. And if everything is correct, as per the Lambda business logic, whatever you have written, it will go output the uh, its status to a cloud form back to cloud formation again. So that cloud formation itself updated its state of a custom resources. So uh, these are the two namespaces that uh, we can use. I mean, either of them, this is the uh, long, long form and this is the short form. So what are the drawbacks, right? I mean, even though cloud formation gives you so much ability, you know, right from multi-account, multi-organization uh, deployment to a custom resources, to stack set, to change set, what are the drawbacks with the cloud formation? So uh, maintenance is definitely hard. Even we try to treat it as a code, but it's actually not a code. It's more of a configuration, right? There is no higher level abstraction. So even though the templating and other things are provided by cloud formation, uh, most of the time the code generated still YAML or JSON and it's hard to maintain. And basically it's not a code, right? I mean, even though uh, the task stack and other CFN lint give the ability to go execute and to maintain a very, very, very high level infrastructure, it's uh, difficult. Uh, that's where the, you know, the, the cloud development kit, it's a recent offering from AWS uh, where you can literally do everything as a code. And uh, how does CDK, behaves it's like definitely it has a stack which is not changed uh, but there are multiple terms multiple utilities that we can go define so you know th there's an application which you know uh, can consist of one or multiple stacks uh, of course there are like cloud formation resources basically this is what we are going to instantiate anyway 
then there are like uh, informants are actually encapsulated. So earlier we used to uh, gather these as a parameters and all, but as a part of software-based development practice, they have actually given provision informant uh, as a you know uh, utility rather than the way like uh, we treat it in code, uh, rather than parameterizing and everybody has their own uh, terminology to define and handle the informants. And what happens when actually we really want to go deploy everything as a uh, code, uh, for example, if there, there is a Lambda function, if there are some utilities, if there's some dependencies that your application has, uh, you can go configure, explain them as asset. And when you actually go deploy everything from a CDK, CDK make sure as per your defined configuration in a code, it will uh, you know create assets and go deploy at a runtime. So we'll see a short demo about this, but before that, let's understand what does it mean, right? So we have seen a configuration for a bucket in a cloud formation template, a cloud formation slide. So here is the same thing uh, at the code level. So what I'm, what we are trying to do is like, uh, I actually literally just a simple code. I imported another core from AWS CDK. Then I, uh, you know, take S3 as a package. Uh, here is my, you know, the name, uh, the class name. Uh, this is just passing the default parameter. Uh, in in the typical CDK scenarios, the self is actually the context, uh, the the class which is being executed, and uh, the scope is a is, is a construct actually, and I'll talk about construct in more detail going forward. And uh, in, in general, it's just a simple function call, right? I mean, you could see like S3 dot bucket self my bucket. I'm creating an application because uh, CDK works at application level, and then you know. Uh, I bundle that application as a stack, as a cloud function stack, and just say, okay, I given a name to that application. I tell him like, okay, I want to deploy it in a, this uh, account and this region. And when I say like app.synth, literally what happens, depending on the code that we have written in our class, this app.synth generates a cloud formation at runtime. Okay. I know it's a lot to grasp, but uh, uh, be with me. Uh, so what are the different offerings that CDK gives like, okay, we see it's a class, not a configuration, but what are the things we can do? So CDK commands is like, uh, you can list all the stack uh, in your project. Uh, you can synthesize like, you know, print the cloud formation template for that, or maybe a particular stack. Then like you can go destroy, you can go deploy. Uh, you can see the compare divisions. Like if you change something and you want to see what really has changed, what is going to impact, uh, you know, and in, in your deployments that you can use a CF, CDK div. Uh, CDK context is like, a, it's it generally like a context, when I mean context is it's simply a dictionary which get passed along. So you can add values to the context and you can refer that values of, of the context into different code segment. So you can see context as a you know, temporary memory area where you can store information and gather along as your code runs. Uh, then you can go to, you know, there are like dog generation is automated and there are potentially problems that like, uh, this is simply like CF and linked where uh, you can define the rules and if there are problems, uh, CDK can help call that out separately for you. Okay, so this is all uh, CDK does. So let's let's go to the demo and uh, I try to, to be more quick. Uh, I have taken it from again, uh, AWS uh, samples uh, repository, uh, but not sure what we are trying to do here. Uh, let me call that out is, um, this is again, one of the typical case of a data lake uh, where you have S3 or RD, uh, RDS for example, and then you have to define a crawler, uh, you know, a simple glue ETL script, and then it, you know, uh, from staging to the intermediate level, it just push the data into S3 and then uh, go call it from Athena or uh, for that matter, right? So uh, to go do, there is a optional step. Again, we'll try to execute it. Uh, in interest of time, we'll see how much we can, but lake formation is one of the service where it helps you to give a column level access from your tables. So glue data catalog, yes, it mentions a repository over S3, like what are the, like if for a typical S3 bucket, what are the columns and other stuff. But once you give access to a database or a table, every user get all the, uh, you know, all, all the information. It has all the access on all the columns. If you want to restrict them to a particular column basis, or even if you want to give them 
like you know a very limited access to your tables uh, the lake formation is a way to go and lake formation is a uh, abstract over a clue uh, which centralizes your permission stores so it doesn't matter you go talk to athena redshape emr you are consistently getting the same permission set and uh, which not the case when you compare to glue okay so let's uh, go dive in uh, okay to so go do that uh, i am in my aws console uh, again as um, ajit mentioned cloud9 is uh, one of the good environments so let's go spin up one i'll go with the default values nothing specific here and all you uh, by the time it gets spin up uh, i didn't click okay sorry yeah by the time it gets spin up what i'll do is uh, we'll go through the repository that we're going to try today uh, so it's like uh, aws samples data lake as a code and this is the same figure that i have pasted in interest of time what we will do we'll cover the s3 part of it like you know there are some buckets on s3 uh, how all that get translated to a table and make it queryable from athena so basically that's something we uh, will do today okay so it's still creating so let's talk about this uh, a typical project as a open source as you could say it's uh, really active updated 4 days ago and there are multiple branches to it and uh, we are going to try so like main line where uh, i am in uh, but there are different tracks where it talks about uh, you know open registry of open data um, there is some more integration than just s3 and mysql and there's a cool uh, blog post if you really want to uh, go understand it in more detail way uh, okay i think can be done much but it takes hard uh, most of the time 2 3 minutes okay okay it's cool it's done so i'm directly jumping into the console so cloud9 is uh, one of the configured uh, you know environment where you can go to devops practices devop based practices so let's uh, uh, try following all of them one by one and we'll see uh, how it instantiates a code for us the infrastructure for us so let's get started mm -hmm. so i pulled up the repo i'm inside so let's create uh, okay first of all we'll install the dependencies uh, it will take minute or two and copy the next command and uh, what this is going to do is like uh, really creating a small stack mm. uh, it's not creating a s3 stack as such but it creating a different aws resources that we will use going forward so by the time this is happening uh, i'll show the data that we are going to process today so this is a uh, standard kaggle titanic data set i've just uh, downloaded this stage.csv that is something we'll import and we'll try to uh, put as a data for our data lake and mean why it's happening I don't worry about the warnings and all here give it stand okay still running uh, okay so by the time it's running uh, cdk is available in multiple languages so python java dot net typescript here the demo and the code repository that we are uh, continuing with is a typescript in TypeScript implementation. And we can go through the project structure till then. So that's how the CDK typical projects look like. Uh, when it comes to defining and you know uh, deploying your stack, uh, this is the TS file. Okay. So, yeah. So basically what we are doing here is uh, we are importing a lot of constructs and construct is a, a templates which bundles up the resources and their properties with a lot of defaults uh, that otherwise are not available so what they are doing here is like there are different construct that they are imported and as we see in a code just like for when we are creating a bucket we are instantiating the app and then we are uh, passing this app to create a different different stack on top of it okay 
So I'm going to mention the deploy and other thing here because we'll be modifying it uh, offhand and then uh, we'll deploy it from a command line. So let me see the status here. Okay, so this is done. Good. Okay, so uh, once I do a deploy stack, it's actually uh, creating, it's actually executing this, uh, you know, uh, core data lake and, you know, existing report stack. Uh, as a stack onto the cloud formation. So let's go see a few of them. How it's happening, how, what's happening onto the, you know, the cloud formation level. Okay, so let's go. Okay, so we're into cloud formation. As you can see, there are a couple of stack. So this is a cloud line. Uh, when I instantiate a cloud line environment, this stack has got created. And uh, as I said, that's how the cloud formation itself is used among the lot of uh, integration within AWS services itself. And one of the example is this, like whenever you instantiate a cloud, cloud line, that's how it's get available to you as a cloud formation stack. Then uh, this is like CDK toolkit stack, which is getting deployed. I guess both of them are ready now. So we'll see what kind of resources it has created. So it's like staging bucket, staging bucket policy. So we have code to create a bucket. That's what they have done. It comes to, okay, they have outputted the bucket name and you know, a domain and other stuff. Parameter, templates, chain set. So this is the first deployment and uh, yeah, it has even created a chain set and executed it. So it doesn't wait for my approval because that's what not this template is configured, but it has created a chain set so that they can maintain the kind of version how the infrastructure has actually grown. So uh, moving along, let's see on S3, what are the things are actually created? So uh, initially there were no buckets. Oh, it seems some error uh, in few of them. I guess most of them. Okay. Okay, I'm unexpectedly seeing few errors, but let's move along. Let's see if it's uh, limit search in some other way and check the status over here in a, okay. So yes, it actually stopped. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's okay, lake formation service access already exist. Okay, got it. Uh, I'll have to change the environment. I have to change the region actually. And unfortunately we have to start from scratch, but just give a few moments and go do that. So what has happened here is like lake formation service role uh, is a role uh, got created because I log into the lake formation So I already created a, actually a, as administrator, I uh, do and create this uh, lake formation. So I guess that's where it's stuck. So what we will do is like, uh, like an interest of time, maybe just, I'll hope let's, let's find it out some other day. It's going to take more than uh, 20, uh, 20, 25 minutes actually. But I'll explain you the steps, uh, how it's get done. So, Basically, once we uh, deploy all the dependencies and then uh, we'll do deploy and update stack, uh, it expected to create all the S3 buckets. Uh, and the, this portion is not created yet. There's a separate section to go create this one. And the lake formation permissions and all it creates, that's why it's stuck today. Uh, Athena and other roles also, it, it was expected to create. So uh, once that is done, how, how do we upload our data and how do we make sure that you know this data lake works? It's like uh, there's a S3 bucket where you can put your files into, and then uh, uh, there is a class example S3 data lake stack. So I'll show it on a cloud formation, even though we're not able to execute, but we'll be able to walk it through. So, okay, so stacks are under uh, the leaps. So, yeah. 
so uh, this is where the second portion of the the project talk about so where we are doing it what we are doing is we are defining a data source which is again a key and then we are specifying our source buckets so as and when we specify source bucket uh, there are step uh, where we can upload that data into that buckets and then uh, execute this stack uh, which again has some uh, glue scripts and everything configured so that uh, when we instantiate these stacks what happens is like it's go to this typical uh, s3 bucket and uh, read that so this crawler aws glue job and everything will get configured and then you can log into your uh, glue you can go to the uh, the workflows so this workflow will be completely automatically configured for you you can go trigger that and then all data lake action happens behind the scene automatically okay so yeah i mean in fact the demo didn't work and again it is of time we cannot redo it uh, is is there any uh, questions anything that we can help you with Sure. Uh, so uh, as you could see, we have uh, seen most of the content from the open source uh, GitHub repository and try to demo as much as it can. Uh, most of the references are actually taken from different online sources and we uh, refer credit to them, not to us uh, for this you know, demo. Uh, thanks for joining. It was a really good discussion uh, with Ajit and all of you today. Uh, what's going to happen next is like we are uh, logically completing the data lake series as we initially from architecture per se then uh, uh, you know from uh, data metrics per se insights per se we covered and in this session we covered more on a DevOps side so it's a uh, logical into a, a data lake series that we have as a clear point and uh, next year we'll uh, begin with more advanced and uh, uh, more detail oriented so again today uh, we really try to cover a lot many things. We will break it down for individual services. And then uh, we have more time to discussion and uh, a concrete depth that we really want to go to. Actually go build some of them. 